Hello and welcome to the Cambridge Union for tonight's Brexit debate. Um, I'm afraid I'm slightly losing my voice, but luckily you've not come to hear from me. You've come to hear from our fine speakers tonight. Now, we're sure that this debate about Brexit tonight will not be divisive in any way. This is famously a friendly debate, which everybody agrees about. But in case it gets out of hand, I thought I'd better lay down some of the ground rules. Three speakers will speak on each side of a motion that we have invited. We'll go one at a time on each side, alternating. Between every two speakers, we will then move to a round of floor speeches. This is the chance for you, the members, to have your say. If you want to speak at that point, you don't just speak in proposition or opposition, you can also speak in abstention of the motion. And for that, please stick your hand in the air and then come here to the front where you'll be given a microphone and about two or so minutes to make your speech. But this is not the only way you can get involved. In the middle minutes of the speech, by any of the main speakers, are you not the first or the last minute, you can make an intervention. You can say, on that point, or point of information, or if I may, and if they accept you, then you will get a microphone given to you and you'll have a chance to have your say and make your point. Please state your name and college if you do either of those things. Um, there are prizes for the best floor speeches. Um, the winner will get a cocktail workshop at Tabouche, and the runner-up will get a personal professional styling session with Ross Giles Styling. So that's very exciting. Um, <laughs> I will begin without further ado. The motion is that this House believes we were right to leave the European Union. I will call our first speaker for the proposition, William Phelps. Will Phelps is a former chair of the Cambridge University Conservative Association and a finalist student of theology. He is, of course, proposing the motion. Will, the floor is yours. Thank you, Gabriel. I must admit I was at first surprised when in Lent 2020 I heard that we'd be discussing yet another Brexit motion. I must confess that my view of Brexit and our nascent relationship with the European Union is akin to that of Norman Tebbit, who quite famously in The Telegraph said that our relationship with the EU after Brexit would be reduced to, thank you very much, we've gone goodbye. But of course this is perhaps idealistic, because if the past three years have taught us nothing, it is that the enemies of democracy, so put by those on the right of the Conservative Party, but I think better phrased as the Remainer class, have stopped at nothing to muddy British political discourse, uh, rehash the issue, and in many respects divide the country at every turn. But of course they have failed and Britain has won. And it's in realizing this that, actually quite perversely, I have been equally inspired to keep the flame of Brexit alive. Because I've realized more in these recent months than any other time in the past three years that in that, that sunny day in June 2016, when 17.2 million proud Brits left their homes and uh, across the country and elected to do the, the effects that we're living today, that is say voted for Brexit, that we should be celebrating. And it's not only Europhiles, or sorry, indeed, Eurosceptics that should be celebrating, but instead lovers of democracy, believers in the nation state and lovers of freedom. And in many respects, this is actually an apt point of departure. Because we must not only ask what Brexit can do for us, but instead what we have left behind. Now, if we trace the origins of the European Union back to its sort of intellectual cornerstone, that is, say, the 1920s, we come across a very peculiar uh, organization called the International Pan-European Union. Now, this is known about by few and understood by even fewer, and I, claim to be, uh, I do not claim to participate in that latter group. But in looking at this, we see the rather odd intellectual heritage that the European Union in its present form enjoys. And this isn't a heritage of national independence, nor is it a heritage of liberal diversity and democracy. Instead, it's an explicit movement towards European federalism, and indeed, forced assimilation. Acutely evidenced in the present existence of the Charlemagne Prize, awarded, of course, to all of those intellectual proprietors of the International Pan-European League, and named, of course, after the first founder of a trans-European empire, there is, I would argue, something insidious sat at the heart of the European project. 
But of course, it's all well to talk about hypothetical concepts and ideas, but we must ask ourselves, how is this manifesting itself in the present day? Well, let's have a look at how Europe and the European Union has progressed since our entry in the early 1970s. What have we seen? We've seen the introduction of the Eurozone, the centralized currency. We've seen the flag. We've seen the anthem. We've seen the constitution. We've seen the disastrous Lisbon Treaty, the extension of the common agricultural policy, the introduction of the awful common fisheries policy, which has done nothing but pillage our waters and pillage our fishing communities. We've seen talk of a centralized treasury increasing, in fact, in recent years, and increasing talk of a European army, proposed most famously in 2015 by Ursula von der Leyen, now president of the European Commission, then German defense minister. These are not the machinations of a devolved economic union concerned only with cooperation and prosperity. Because if we look at the path of European history, particularly the political history since the 1970s, it's been shown quite well what the Union has in store. Because it's called the European Project for a reason. It's not finished, nor will it be, until total assimilation, integration, and federalization has been achieved. So what then of Brexit? I say, thank God. It's just a shame it happened two decades too late. So if you believe in the principles of national self-determination, of the freedom of the nation state, of legal, linguistic, social, and cultural diversity, as has existed on this great continent since the days of Rome, we must look at Brexit as an unmit unmitigated good. And in 1641, John Milton actually wrote of the English people, he said that, the, that England has divine precedence to be the restorer of buried truth. And I'd argue that this applies equally today as it did in the 17th century. Britain, as it always has been, stands now in a post-Brexit age as a world leader in a new order of democracy and freedom divorced from an insidious European project. But this is not to suggest that we're sacrificing anything. Although the language may be religious, we are bearing no crucifix. If we turn our eyes to domestic politics inward, not only to how the political system in Britain is playing out at the moment, but to our wider geopolitical situation. The scene I'm presented with is what many Europhiles would describe as an ode to joy. It's here that the arguments of the opposition will no doubt begin to fall down. Because unlike the past two and a half years, fear-mongering conjecture does not stand up to hard facts. The promised apocalypse of food shortages, civil war, death on the streets, and two-hour queues outside of Dover and Kent simply haven't materialized. With the exception of the last point, I think actually that description is far, a far more apt portrayal of many southern European member states of the, of the EU, more than it is of Britain. And so we must ask ourselves, what do we have instead? We're seeing an economy that has, is at really an all-time high in recent uh, years. It's beginning to boom. Economic confidence is soaring. We're seeing a restoration of that confidence in our justice system and our borders. And for the first time in living memory, we are seeing the development of a truly global Britain. The number of international trade deals expected to come into effect after the end of the withdrawal period is increasing uh, at a regular and um, exponential rate. And with the cuts in EU immigration, yep. It's very Could you easy. wait for a microphone from the floor? <laughs> We've got people watching on the live stream and I'm sure they'll want to hear your point. Uh, yes, it's very easy for the amount of potential trade deals that were being offered to exponentially increase when there were so few beforehand, do you not think? Well, of course, and that's the problem with the European Union. A great nation like Britain with its GDP and the industrial heritage we have was unable to sign its own trade deals. And now, for the first time, liberated from the shackles of federalization and centralization, we are able to break free. And so that's why I would argue that not only with these trade deals, but also the cuts in EU immigration we can have a truly international exchange of skills and services and ideas that Britain has historically enjoyed and done very well off. Of course, turning our eyes even further inward in December, we saw the ousting of parties of both anti-Semitism and anti-democracy, and for the first time in some years, the British people are rising up together, placing faith in a truly united vision of Britain. So then when I look ahead to the years that lie before us, I'm filled not with... Fear, but instead with hope. Though perhaps sadly I resemble, and I feel this way from time to time, the Emperor Nero, standing, looking over the English Channel at the only half metaphorical burning Rome. And this is the third point that we cannot neglect. The fact that Europe and the European Union is by no means smooth sailing. 
More than ever before, the European Union presents a picture of social disharmony, of rising authoritarianism, of unemployment and economic decline. France, Italy, Greece, Hungary and Poland are but a few. So let's join together, and in defense not only of Britain, but also in opposition to these trends that are so worryingly manifesting themselves on the continent, in opposition to these European liberal values which we hold to be true. Let's rise both in favor of this great island nation, but also democracy, freedom, and the nation state. 2,000 years ago, we saw Pax Romana, and I'm afraid to say that Pax Brucheli has failed. So in 2020, let's place our faith in Pax Britannica, because unlike those that opposite, we may be positive. We have faith in ourselves, our nation, and our values that as European people, we hold dear to ourselves. And in this sense, I would argue we cannot say we regret Brexit. Thank you. Thank you very much, Will, for that enlightening speech. I suppose we knew what we were getting when we invited you. Um...